Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with James Siegel, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Kaboom. Kaboom seeks to give children across the nation the childhood they deserve, filled with balance and active play. James has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, James, for joining us today. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Kaboom. So talk about Kaboom and what does it mean to have balanced and active play? What we want is to make sure that kids get a full balance in the same way that when you're eating healthy, you're getting a full balanced meal. Um, we want for kids to grow up getting a full balance of play. And what that means is physical benefits. So that's the obvious one. You see kids running around, you see them jumping and skipping, you know that it's benefiting them physically. But in addition to that, play is critical for developing the cognitive and creative abilities of kids. It's also what it enables kids to build strong social and emotional connections with their peers and with the adults in their lives. And so play benefits the whole child, and we need to make sure that kids get the balance of play so that they could fully develop uh, and become healthy and successful adults. What is play actually? It's interesting because people debate that all the time, and we don't want to get bogged down in an academic debate. And, and I'm sure and, you debate it internally to Kaboom. Yeah, and for us, play is the work of childhood. It's how kids interact with the world, it's how they have fun, and so if you want to get kids to do something, you say let's play. And that can range from everything from playing on a playground, which is great because it gets the full benefits of physical, cognitive, creative, and social and emotional uh, development, but it's also playing sports, it's playing chess, it's drawing, it's using your imagination. All of those are forms of play. And for us, all of those forms of play are what kids need. Kids need more of all of it, and they need it in a balanced way. What we like to see is letting kids play in a variety of different ways, whether it's playing with water or playing with blocks that are manipulable. If you see kids play, what they want to do is create their own world. And what we as adults need to do is create a protective, caring environment for them to do that. So let's talk about creating one's own world. How do you create play that encourages uh, a child to create their own world? It's interesting because there's a small but vocal group within the play community that thinks that kid-only, kid-directed play is the purest form of play and the only thing that kids need. To us, that feels a little bit like Lord of the Flies. And what we see is that what's most important in kids' lives, particularly the kids we serve, which are the 16 million kids growing up in poverty in this country, is what they need is caring, engaged adults in their lives. And that doesn't mean that there's not a role for kid-directed play, but it means that adults are important in creating the parameters for play so it's productive and, it's, and it creates an environment where kids learn how to get along in a safe way. Is there a different role that adults have in this constellation than children have? Yeah, and we're all for adults playing with kids. Mm -hmm. In fact, recently we launched a national contest with our great partner, Disney Parks and Resorts, to find America's most playful family. And what we found from that is that there are families across the country that are using play as a way to build strong family connection, which we know is so critical to childhood development. What we also found from the folks who self-identified to us as low income is that low income families are using play as an alternative to expensive opportunities for family engagement that they can't afford. So whether it means going on vacation, or going out to dinner or going to the movies. Families that play together are able to form those bonds and it could be you know, dancing around the dinner table, it could be going outside and throwing a ball around, it could be a lot of different things, but they're doing that as a way to build those strong family connections when they don't have other options. Talk a, a bit more about your relationships that, that allow you to evaluate of how you go about evaluation, how you share that information with others. What we see in the nonprofit world, and this is a, a vast oversimplification, but there are a lot of pressures on nonprofits in these directions, is that on the one hand, you see the gold standard for evaluation, which is randomized control trials. And that has its role, particularly when you're talking about high volume social service delivery systems. Right. The other end of the spectrum is if you can't do a randomized control trial, let's just do trial and error. 
we'll try something. It didn't work. Let's try something else. We'll, it didn't work. We'll try something else. And what we're trying to chart is a course that's more along the lines of experimentation, which means let's do a deep analysis to develop some key hypotheses. And then we're going to test those hypotheses to see if the hypothesis turns out to be true and learn from that experience and then repeat. Part of your work is advocacy. So as you're advocating, how do you how do you execute that part of your mission? Do you bring children and adults in, sit them in rows of desks, and and have somebody sit at the, sit at the front and, and lecture them on, on how they should think about cities? Or, or are you uh, incorporating some of your philosophy into how you market this message and, and convince people of the importance of this type of play? We have a two-pronged mobilization strategy. One, like you mentioned, is focused on cities because play issues, whether it's investment in infrastructure, policy, or programming, happens at the local level. Right. And so for them, we consider it a domino effect. We want a few leading cities to lead the way and, and be an example that other cities want to follow. So if you think about plastic bags, mm -hmm. a few years ago, San Francisco banned plastic bags and they did it for environmental reasons. Cities across the country s stood up and took notice and said, hey, we're going to either ban plastic bags or we're going to tax them so it drives a revenue stream for us. But you know that it's really taking root when you go to the grocery store and you're embarrassed because you forgot to bring your canvas bag along. That, that means that the policy has translated into behavior change where people are actually changing their behavior and a new norm has been established where the expectation is people don't use plastic bags. And they're not motivated by a tax or a ban, they're motivated by peer pressure, which is in many ways a stronger motivation. So have you created proof of concepts in various cities that you then use to highlight and, and use those as a way to convince others of, of the efficacy of, of those programs? For us, it's about making sure all cities are on the path to success. And there are a few leading cities that are taking more comprehensive action to make their communities more playful. For example? For example, Chicago. So Mayor Emanuel, um, he has done several things. One is that he's invested heavily in school playgrounds, particularly in communities where kids are traditionally underserved. Right. He's put a lot of money behind it, um, and there's great action that's happening now to bring play opportunities to kids across the community, and his goal is to make sure that every sh Chicagoan li lives within seven minute walk of a park or playground, which is an ambitious goal. And he hasn't stopped there. He also looked at the school day, and things like recess and PE have gone the way of the dodo bird. Right. And what he did was he extended the school day in order to bring back recess and PE and arts and culture, which he knows are so important to develop the whole child. And it's comprehensive, comprehensive action like that where you start to see momentum where kids are actually playing more. And so Chicago is a terrific example. And we see other cities that are starting to focus more heavily on play, which is a great thing. And our role is to help bring them along further faster. So folks in the walkability and bikeability movements have been claim, you know, claiming the space and trying to move cities along for a generation. And finally, you see places like DC and New York and Chicago really trying to make their cities walkable and bikeable. You see bike share programs taking off. And other cities are now trying to follow suit because they see that they need to in order to compete. We don't want to wait around for a generation. And so we're trying to create a platform where cities can learn from each other mm -hmm. and can tackle big, bold goals. So we're going to be hosting a summit in Chicago in this, this fall in October. We're going to bring together 8 to 12 leading cities as teams, both folks within the city government, nonprofit leaders in the community, private sector participants as well, to come up with their bold goal, which is what they're trying to achieve as a city. Their action plan. And then how, what's their big idea for using play to achieve that bold goal? And from that will flow their action plan. How is Kaboom organized? We have a staff of over 100 now. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of our folks focus on what we're best known for, which is building playgrounds in partnership with low-income communities across the country. And a budget of? A budget of, it's approaching $30 million a year now. Okay. And the team that works on building playgrounds in partnership with communities across the country, that's a community building model. And so we partner, uh, we pair a funding partner with a community organization, usually a child-serving nonprofit, a homeless shelter, a local affiliate of a boys and girls club, a charter school, and we work together with the community through a several month process to prepare for building a playground in one day. And we bring together 200 volunteers, half from the community, half from the funding partner. People roll up their sleeves and in six hours you create a transformative moment where a vacant lot transforms into a beautiful new playground that kids can use. And that vacant lot is now owned because it was built by the community That's itself. Right. The first thing that our project manager does when they start working with a community partner is they have the kids in the community sit down and draw out, design their dream playground. And so we give them big pieces of paper and crayons or magic markers and they draw what they think should be on the playground. And you'll see tr terrific things. A lot of kids, you know, their swings or their monkey bars. We see trampolines a lot. Uh, one kid drew a shark tank. That one we did not do. Um, <laughs> so our project manager works with the community and they form committees to do everything from solicit volunteers to get donations of food for the build day to raising money because for all of our communities we require some skin in the game. Right. Um, so a modest amount that the community must raise to match what the funding partner is bringing to the table. Now the competencies of the staff that contribute to Kaboom uh, are very interesting because it, 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 it's not like one can have a uh, major in, in designing playgrounds. And in, so talk about uh, uh, the, the people that you attract to Kaboom and where they come from and, and what their backgrounds are. We have five traits that we look for in everyone who works at Kaboom, and we call ourselves boomers. And so the five boomer traits are can do, will do, team fit, damn quick, and damn smart. Everyone at Kaboom exemplifies those characteristics. Now what's interesting is for the history of Kaboom, as you can imagine, the process of building a playground with hundreds of volunteers requires a level of operational excellence. Right. And so we have tons of folks who are just terrific project managers and excellent at ensuring that a process achieves the result at the end of the day. So have you become, or, or do you intend to become more of an advocacy organization, a convening organization, uh, where you are trying to galvanize action amongst people who are at the grass tops, the grassroots level, uh, to create a consensus surrounding actions that need to be taken across uh, society to encourage play? About 18 months ago we embarked on a strategic planning process and we took a big step back and asked ourselves a critical question which is what problem we're trying to solve. And we did it from a position of strength. It was at a time when we were as an organization very successful so we were not doing it in an attempt to figure out a new future be out of necessity. Right. We could have gone on doing what we've been doing, but we decided that we were in the business of solving societal level problems and we needed to figure out what that was. So the real problem was a society level problem, complex in its nature, which was that kids were not getting the play that they needed to thrive, and there were a lot of reasons for that. One was certainly that there are not enough play spaces in the right. world, but beyond that, it was the pressure of technology in kids' lives, and for the kids that we serve, the 16 million kids growing up in poverty, a key challenge is the safety of their neighborhood. And so for us, we said, okay, we need to be in the business of ensuring that all kids get the play that they need to thrive. Right. So our bold goal is that all 16 million kids growing up in poverty get that. And then that caused us to rethink what that meant for us as an organization in terms of our focus. And so. What we saw was in order to get to that society level change, we needed to go through the route of behavior change and norm change because we couldn't scale up the direct service model to meet that need. Too expensive, would take too long to get to. In our 18 year history, 
we've been able to provide great places to play for over six million kids. But there are currently 16 million kids growing up in poverty. Right. So scale of that model was just not the, the route that we saw. So what conclusion did you reach? We, we determined that we needed to be able to affect widespread behavior change, and we needed to create a new norm where the expectation was that kids got the play that they needed and that communities were reinforcing that, whether it's the family unit, the city, or otherwise, community was reinforcing the need that play, that play happens every day for kids. And in order to do that, we had to both create the opportunity for play to happen, but also distribute the responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility to make sure kids get the play that they need. And so that, from that, we landed on three strategy buckets. One is what we've been doing for 18 years, which is creating and catalyzing great places to play. That's who we are, it's our DNA, it's the direct impact that we have that enables us to have the credibility to speak to the larger cause. But on top of that, we needed to mobilize advocates, both at the grass tops level, city leaders, and also at the grassroots level. And we needed to elevate the national conversation about the importance of play in kids' lives, which is often seen as a nice to have, but not necessary. And so what we've been doing since then is figuring out what our role is in mobilization and in thought leadership that's gonna elevate the importance of play. Every day, relatable heroes in communities across the country are taking action to promote and protect play. And so that could be the mom who's lobbying the school board for more recess in schools. It could be the person who goes out into the parks on the weekends to create activities where kids come out with their families to play. It could be a group that organizes to make sure a playground is safe, a neighborhood watch group around the playground. Infinite ways where individuals are empowered and can take action to promote and protect play in their community and create that groundswell where cities then need to take steps to make it more comprehensive. But also, those same folks are folks who can be advocates in their community for play to happen. And so a lot of our focus now is on mobilizing those folks to take increasing steps of action to make play happen in their community. And what we found was we did not have an awareness problem on our hands. This is not a problem that would be solved by a PSA campaign. Survey after survey shows that over 90% of parents understand that play is good for their kids. How could you not as a parent? Right. So it wasn't about convincing people that play was important. It was about going steps beyond that. And so if you have that basic awareness, we need to generate a sense of urgency around the importance of play to the kids that you care most about. A wonderful story, a wonderful objective. James Siegel, thank you so much for sharing the work of Kaboom with us, and thank you so much for your insight. My pleasure, thanks for the opportunity.